Our week in and week out, we look at the bulletin that reflects the order uh, that we will follow in the worship service. Now, sometimes you do know that we don't follow the order because sometimes the Holy Spirit has other plans, right? Amen, amen. So why is there order, someone may ask, and, 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 and what does it all mean? Today we begin a sermon series on worship, and the sermon series is titled Worship with Rejoicing. It's a series that will remind us of the purpose of the order of service or the order that we will follow when we gather for public worship. The word worship means attributing worth. And so for this day, we're going to focus on gathering for worship. In her book, Worship for the Whole People of God, author Ruth C. Duck reminds us that God alone is holy and worthy of our glory and praise. Can I get an amen at that point? Yeah. Let me repeat it because you may not have heard it. God alone. No human being, God alone, is holy and worthy of our glory and praise. She informs us, and I quote, Christian worship is oriented toward praising and thanking God and transforming all of creation. Worship focuses on glorifying God and transforming human beings. And Christian worship is to be transformative because over time it is meant to change us individually and as the community of faith from the inside out. If you began worshiping God at the age of five, you will probably not be the same at the age of 35, prayerfully not, because over time, your encounter with the awesome living God has brought about transformation in your life. An encounter with the living God and the risen Christ in the spirit is, or I would suggest should be, life-changing. This encounter heals, renews, and challenges. This encounter creates community and sends us out to create peace and justice in the world, end of quote. Worship is our response to what God has done in our lives. So today, our focus is on our coming together and gathering for worship in one space, to worship the God who has been revealed to us through Jesus Christ. So we gather not only to have an encounter with one another, and that encounter is wonderful, we gather first and foremost, beloved, to have a personal and community encounter with God. So I'm thankful for those individuals who assist us with the process of preparing for worship. But let me ask you this question first. How do you prepare for worship personally? How do you prepare for public worship? What process do you follow in preparation for public worship? And how do we as a community prepare for public worship? I'm very thankful for those who assist us with the process of preparing for worship as we gather for worship at Evangel Heights United Methodist Church. Those who provide hospitality as we enter the narthex. I'm thankful for our greeters, um, Pam Bliley and Crystal Clear and Tina and Red Harris and Dar and Dennis Doverspike, Joe Hess and Donna Hill. I'm thankful for Kathy Hoffman Siders and Jonathan. I'm thankful for Terry and for Rich, and, and I'm thankful for Karen and Emily Pugh. I began using full names, then I just jumped to the first names. I'm sorry, I'll go back. I'm thankful for Dale and Trina and Josh Lacrone, and I'm thankful for Terry Kiernan. I'm thankful for Ben and Rosie Monroe and Marilyn Moutre and Karen O'Shea and Lee. Rerick for Sandy Stanley, 
for the Turba family, for Shirley Weiss. I'm thankful for these greeters. I'm also thankful for the ushers, for Terry and Kathy and Ken and Penny and, of course, our head ushers, Bobby and David. I'm thankful for the ways in which these individuals help us to prepare for public worship by their facial expressions, their smiles, by their directions and their guidance. Yes, 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 yes. How do you prepare for public worship? I would suggest to you that in addition to our searching our hearts, making sure that there is no unconfessed sin, I, I would suggest to you that, that uh, we prepare for public worship by coming to worship with the expectation of having an encounter with God. Uh, through, this, through this order of service, we, we trust God to speak to us individually and as the community of faith. We also prepare for worship by remembering. Remembering what God has done and is doing in our lives, in the life of our nation, in the life of the world. I want us for a moment to just take a glimpse at a worshiper by the name of David. And you know what, when it comes to the message, um, it's not, um, we don't have the, the specific uh, verses. Uh, the author, the late uh, Eugene Peterson, would, would put several verses together. And so as you were reading about uh, worship, from our uh, uh, first reading, uh, you were reading about David dancing and then all of a sudden somebody died. Okay, that was for another sermon, but I just want you to know. As you look at first at 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 1 through 5, what we're doing is we're witnessing the return of the ark. It, it had been in Kareth Jerum, a Gibeonite town in the territory of Judah in the possession of Abinadab for 20 years. The Ark of God was the chief symbol of God's presence in the midst of Israel. This Ark was where God would meet God's people, and yet, for 20 years, the Israelites were not able to see the physical representation of God's presence. Now, if you want to learn more about this this, this chest that was made of acacia wood that was overlaid with gold inside and out that had um, a cover called the mercy seat where the cherubim were facing one another and their wings were touching one another, um, I would suggest to you, and by the way, do we have a picture of the ark? Yeah, we do. That's just one um, rendition of the ark. And um, this is what? David and uh, 30,000 men escorted back to Jerusalem. In Hebrews chapter 9, verses 2 through 5, uh, we are told of the contents within this ark the Mosaic law, a pot of manna, and the rod of Aaron. Notice, notice in 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 1 through 5, David's response to being in possession of this ark. This ark that represents the presence of God. David dances. David worships God. Now, for David, worship was life. Worship wasn't something David did. It wasn't a specific time in the day or week. Rather, worship was who David was. He lived and breathed worship, which means his life, his mind stayed on God. When you read several Psalms written by David, Psalm 8, Psalm 18, you will be able to hear the worship oozing through these Psalms. Now, if you want to read why the ark was returning to the Israelites, why the ark is being escorted to Jerusalem, I invite you to read 1 Samuel chapters 4 and 5. Now, this text, beloved, is used to support the liturgical dance in the church, and, and that's fine. But it's not the primary reason 
that this text is in God's word, I would suggest to you that the focus is not on the dance, but on the presence and power of God. 1 Samuel chapter 5 again describes such power when the ark that represents the presence of God was in the hands of the Philistines. Yes, David dances and worships. And David is not alone. The entire procession of 30,000 people are dancing and worshiping because they know that they are in God's presence. They are celebrating the fact that they are in God's presence. Hmm. So as we, as we gather for worship, what can we glean from this text? First and foremost, let's celebrate the fact that the God whom we serve is in our midst. You see, David was in God's presence, and David knew that he was in God's presence because there was the ark. David also remembered how God had intervened in his life, how God had saved David from his enemies, from King Saul, from the Philistines. Yes, for David, worship was life. And it wasn't that he worshiped during the good times. How do I know that worship was his life? Because when his firstborn son, born of Bathsheba, died, you recall the story, while the baby was alive, David fasted and prayed. But when David was informed that his baby had died, what did he do? He got up, he bathed, he anointed himself, and he worshiped God. See, there are some people who will only worship God when things are going well. And when things are not going well, they're gonna question God, why, 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 why? As opposed to trusting God and thanking God for being with them. Yes, David, David wasn't perfect, you and I know that, you know how David, again, committed adultery, committed murder, and yet, through it all, David lived as though his life was an offering to God. In Romans chapter 12, verses one and two, and you heard the text, the author says, in essence, this is what I want you to do. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life with God's help and place it before God as an offering. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Oh, I just heard the word wake up. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. That is what worship is to do, isn't it? To transform us from the inside out, readily recognizing what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you always dragging you down to its level of immaturity. God, not humanity, God, not your BFF, God, not your profession, God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. Now, here's the good news, here's the good news. The good news for us is that God does not come to us in an ark. <laughs> no, God comes to us in Jesus Christ. The presence of God that was represented by the ark is now represented by Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ whose life demonstrated God's ways, whose death demonstrated God's love for us, and whose resurrection demonstrated God's power over death 
and sin and all creation, a power that you and I now have through the giving of the Holy Spirit who is with us and who lives in us, all of us who claim Jesus Christ as our Savior, the news is praiseworthy. That God comes to us in Jesus Christ. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm thankful that I have entered into the presence of God to worship God this day in spirit and in truth. I'm thankful today that God has come to us through Jesus Christ. I'm thankful today that because God has come to us through Jesus Christ, we have the power to live a life of transformation. <laughs> oh, beloved, I would suggest to you that because of this good news, you and I, we can come to the table the Lord's table, the table that reminds us of God's love for us, a table that reminds us of the depth of that love, the giving of his son, Jesus Christ, on the cross, a table that reminds us that Jesus did not stay dead but rose with all power in his hands. So whatever you are facing today, here's the good news. You're not facing it alone. God knows. And God is able to help you to deal with it individually and also will help you through this community of faith. Mm. God invites us to rethink our priorities. And for those of us who have been walking with God through Jesus Christ for a very long time, it's still time for us to rethink our priorities. For those who've not even thought about having a relationship with God, it's time for you to rethink your priorities. So in, during this moment, we invite you, if you not invited Jesus Christ into your life as your Savior and Lord. This is a good time to do that, to acknowledge that you are separated from God because of sin, but Jesus Christ is the answer to your sin problem. And so to invite Jesus Christ into your life as your Savior, this is a good day to do that. And maybe you have invited Jesus Christ into your life as Savior, and Lord, and you recognize that you've drifted away, life got busy, this is a good time to recommit your life to Jesus Christ. And then maybe you, you're, you're in need of prayer today. We've identified for you persons who are available to pray with you after the worship service. We invite you to reach out to one of them. I'm going to ask the prayer warriors uh, to raise your hands again. And they are available. Thank you. I'm going to invite uh, Brian and Rob to please come and prepare for communion by putting the rail in place. 